Hornby, welcome to BIF Digital, part of Buxton International Festival. I'm sorry we can't be together in person. Um, no, am I. I mean, it's lovely to be here. I must confess from the start that I, I don't consider myself a Janeite. Um, apart from persuasion, which I do consider needs to be reread every two years, I probably hadn't revisited um, Jane Austen's other um, five full length works um, since I was a teenager until I read your lovely book. And this is meant as high praise indeed, but it's certainly uh, Miss Austen absolutely takes you back, takes you running back to Jane's uh, lovely books. And it's for me, and actually you've been playful because you read your book and you feel that you've been caught up in Jane's world and actually the world that you present is 23 years on. Could you set the scene for us? Yes, the, um, the novel opens in 1840 when Jane's sister Cassandra, who has outlived Jane by, by 24 years, um, arrives at the vicarage in Kintbury on a slightly sort of secret mission to stay with the, her old family friends, the Fowls. Um, towards the end of Cassandra's life, Cassandra and Jane Austen were incredibly close, as close as two sisters can be. They were the two girls in a sea of brothers. There were eight children all together, so six boys and two girls. And they were always really, really close and um, Jane died in her arms. They lived together all their lives. Jane died in her arms. Cassandra lived on a long time and was very much the keeper of the flame. She was the literary executor and, and she was the protector of the legacy. And towards the end of it, it's a matter of record that towards the end of Cassandra's life, she sat down and went through nearly all the letters that the two women had exchanged to one another over their lifetimes. And she burnt, the majority of them. She burned all of Cassandra's own replies and she burned all but 160 of the ones that Jane had written to her, which is nothing in the concept, context of a Regency lifetime, you know, 160 letters, you could get through that in a few months. Um, so my novel is to set out really what she was trying to hide with the ones that she burned. It was clean, clearly a clean up exercise, a sort of sanitation process on Jane's reputation. In the village of Kintbury was a very a family who lived here for 99 years in that, and I now live in the old vicarage in Kintbury, which is why I picked that as the, as the sort of scene of the novel. Um, they were very, very close friends to the Austins, the, the Fowl family, the um, middle rector. There were three vicars, grandfather, father and son. The middle one was, was Jane's father's best friend at Oxford. And the third one was um, friends of all of them. And one of the sons had been the fiance of Cassandra Austin back at the end of the 18th century. And it was the perfect match. He was a curate, she was a rector's daughter. The both of families were very close friends. It was a real sort of, um, kinship sort of um, match. And then a uh, tragedy intervened and he died before they could marry. With the consequence that Cassandra never married, which very much led, I think, it enabled Jane to, na to not marry either. And so the two women lived together in great harmony and Cassandra sort of became Jane's almost manager, her wife, she ran the house. And, and, you know, said, you get on with the writing and, and was the first one to listen to everything that she wrote. And, and Jane very much valued her, her judgment. When I was trying to get away into this novel, I went back to the official book of letters. And in the introduction, it says that not only were there endless letters between the two women, but of course there would have been so many to relatives in Kent, where her brother lived, and also friends in Berkshire. And I thought, well, of course, they would have written millions of letters here. They were all incredibly close friends. The children all grew up together. Um, so then I, and I realized that the time that Cassandra was having her bonfire of letters was also the time 
when the family was having to move out of here after a 99 year stint. And it was left to one, the last remaining spinster daughter to clear out a house that they'd lived in for a century. Um, when there would have been a lot of Austin letters here. So it's not a totally implausible prospect that Cassandra, that there would have been letters. None of them have turned up. Um, Cassandra did make a last visit to Kimbury for sentimental reasons. And so that gave me my plot. So she's sort of looking for the letters in, in case there's indiscretions in them that might tarnish Jane's memory. Um, and then I use the letters that she finds as a sort of gateway back to the past to examine the two women's lives and their relationship. <clears throat> so you play with a uh, literary legacy um, and actually there are just snippets of Jane Austen's work just played through the book as two of the characters are reading to each other of an evening, which is really lovely and it roots it back into Jane's work. So there's a literary legacy, there's a kind of biographical legacy. So what is, what is understood of the family and those characters, but in terribly important is financial legacy. So uh, money so is terribly important. Money to... is everything. <laughs> and actually you can reread Jane's novels as as kind of books about money. Everything is about money. Um, all of her heroines, apart from Emma, are in peril at the beginning of the book, of the novel, and all of them have been rescued by somebody else's money by the end of them. And the reason Emma is such a standout novel is because of that first sentence, you know, she was rich. And when Tom dies, Tom Fowles, so uh, Cassandra's lost love, there's a lovely line where she's where you have her say, this is this was the thing she would be defined by from here on, which of course is funny to us with hindsight, because of course it's actually so not the thing that she's defined by. The thing she's defined by is the burning of the letters and, and being the sister. Um, yes, absolutely. But um, the thing is, it was an important definition, married or not married. Uh, married women had status, unmarried women, women had none. So it, it was the, def the definition of your life. It was if you managed to marry somebody or not. And, and they're, a, they're a complex family. I mean, the family tree for the, for, for the Fowles, the Lloyds, the Austens is incredibly com complex. Um, you very have entwined. In, yeah, incredibly entwined. But you also have almost these incredibly poignant sentences within that family history of somebody who becomes a second wife but takes on nine children from the first marriage and and then has some more children um it's an incredibly complex family tree you have a pin board behind you and <laughs> if you talk through this sort of authorial process because i imagine you am absolutely involved in writing this book with an enormous family tree full of dates and you've alluded to the fact that um, that there were no letters left and yet when I was reading the book I just presumed that say half were your made up letters and, and absolutely half were extant letters and it's only when I got to the end when I read your note which is there were no letters I've completely made this up and the only thing that's real is um, is is brother Austin sorry his name's James isn't it James James, James Austin James Austin, it's terrible, terrible poetry. <laughs> um, tell us about the kind of authorial process where you sit there and, and write these, imagine these letters. Strangely enough, that was one of the easy bits, in <laughs> fact. I was determined to write a novel about Cassandra. That's what I wanted to do. I thought she'd been a very undervalued um, member of the family. And I thought the, um, she needed to be given the credit she was due. Of course, I couldn't do that without writing about Jane. I was very, very nervous about bringing Jane in. I wasn't so nervous about the letters. I was nervous about her walking and talking and thinking and in conversation and, and, and you know, uh, and putting breath into her as, as a sort of character, a living being. That I was nervous about, and I kept putting it off and putting it off. 
And then I read one of the first letters that Jane ever wrote to Cassandra. I reread it that is to Kimbury when she's staying with Tom before his travels. And she said, she's very young, Jane, and it's the first time they've been apart. And she says something, I'm paraphrasing, like, um, I've got the hang of this letter writing, Lark. You just kind of um, write as if the person is sitting there opposite to you and you're chatting to them. And I thought, okay, I'll take your word for it. So that's how you talk to one another. I can mimic that. And then the letters themselves, she has a very specific letter style and, and she has that irony. But they're not, the letters that we've got, they're not great treatises on political opinion or on thought or on philosophy. They are, where did you go? What was the weather like? What was the grub like? Is anyone dead? How, you know, is so and so better? They were newsletters. And so once I sort of got the chronology of where she was at the time, I could just knock off, and I was quite knocking them off actually towards the end, knock off a letter in her style, sort of set around those, those events. I know I come out as a bit of a hack. <laughs> but funnily enough, once I got her voice, I couldn't shut her up. <laughs> I'd imagine, I'd imagine she'd be a much smaller character in the book because that was it was all about the, all about the other sister, but um, she went running away with things and dialogue and um, and and she was very much in my head. You make it sound very easy, and I'm sure. Oh, well, no, I mean the structure of the novel was not easy, and I've never written a historical novel before, so you know the whole thing was a bit of a struggle. <laughs> And, and you capture um, you capture a style of Austin humor, which is which is apparent through the book. And and there's there's lovely phrases like a woman not previously associated with social harmony. I mean that just feels very Austin to me. Um, and I think this is brought into is best achieved with with Mary Austin, who is. Yeah quite ghastly absolutely awful and i think that's one of the reasons cassandra burnt a lot of the letters because i think there was a lot of bitching about mary between the two of them mary lloyd was the sister of their best friend martha who ended up living with them in the georgian cottage and when their elder brother james the writer of the execrable poetry when he became a widower in his sort of early 30s. The Austin ladies actually plotted for Mary to be his second wife. She had no money or anything, and she was plain as anything because they, she'd had smallpox as a child. Um, but they thought that she would be solid and a nice stepmother to their beloved little niece, who was only three when her mum died. And as soon as she was married, she became the smug marriage from hell and very, very patronizing to the women and was no end of trouble, really. Um, and there was just this constant, you know, Austin herself is very good on this. There's family re relations, there's the, there's the embarrassing mother and there's the ghastly aunt, like Aunt Norris and all these things that we all have. And then there's these um, involuntary relations that come into your life, like sisters-in-law that you can't do anything about <laughs> and are quite capable of sort of ruining your life. So um, yes, Mary is fantastic because she left a notebook and it's so miserable and negative and me, 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 that it totally encapsulates everything that Jane and Cassandra loathed about the woman. So she is a perfect, Austin baddie, you know, she is, she is your Aunt Norris or whatever. And it's very interesting, actually, that all apart from Mary Bennett, all the, all the bad Marys in, oh no, Mary Bennett's terrible, all the bad, bad women in Austin are called Mary, um, which is obviously a slight sort of private thing that she had going on. And I hope I do this justice, but you have this very clever, you, so you're writing a letter that is Mary's letter to Eliza after she's relay, relayed the news about poor Tom's death um, to Cassandra. So it's your fictional letter, which is supposed to be a real letter. And then Cassandra reads it and she feels that it's a parody, that actually it's something that's been slipped in from her sister because it's so ghastly. 
So it's mm -hmm. this incredible network, really, of, of kind of reaction to something that actually turns out it's not real at all, <laughs> which is a lovely... Yes, but it's quite, really quite plausible because at about the time, soon after um, James and Mary got married and she began this progression into being the smug married, that was when um, Cassandra lost her fiancé. And it is written that, that uh, Mary went with James to break the news. The Fowles wrote to Mary and James and said, this terrible thing has happened. We can't write her directly. Go, you know, will you go and tell her in person? And Mary has left an account saying um, she, left, she had a terrible fit of the hysterics when um, she told her. But uh, Austin Law is that Cassandra was unbelievably noble about the whole thing, you know, that she just totally took it in her stride. She plunged into mourning and wore black for years and years and years. So there was never a hope of her finding another, um, another gentleman. Um, and, and you do shoot the messenger, you know, I bet, I bet Jane and Cassandra loathed her because of the way she came and, and told her her life was ruined like, like that. And I'm sure she would have done it with no tact whatsoever. Could, I enjoyed writing that one. I'm sure. And the other person, the other character, well, in fact, there's two other characters that I feel your enjoyment is Mary Jane Dexter and Pyramus. Yes. Could Pyramus you just is a dog? Pyramus is a dog. And when I went to um, the library and went through all the old, um, you know, newspapers, I found the, the will of that rector and it said, you know, or the, or the obituary. And it said he went everywhere with his dog Pyramus beside him. And I thought, Pyramus, that's a great name for a dog. He's got to go in there. So yes, I like Pyramus. I mean, Pyramus um, doesn't really do anything, but he's just absolutely a rock. He's, terrible. he's a dog-like creature, yes. He's, he's utterly <laughs> empathetic. He's very responsive to needs and what have you. And you completely fall in love with him. And I'm absolutely delighted that that Cassandra at the end decides to have her dog and and, That's that, true. and yeah. that you say at the end that she that she spent the end of her life with her beloved dog line and I think oh yeah. oh good that's that's perfect well well done you yeah. so Mary Jane Dexter I mean she Mary Jane Dexter is a real person she's buried in our churchyard here she is buried with her husband's sword in her coffin and she was the eldest daughter of the Fowl family and she was the only one that married uh, and I think she married because they were so desperate to get rid of her they agreed a suit with the first person who came along who happened to take her off to India and they didn't seem to mind bye because she was so incredibly difficult um, but then he he died and she came back and ended up in the village in a house that, that is still there looking over the churchyard and she did have a lot of Indian relics and she slept with a pistol under her pillow. <laughs> because of all of the constant insurrections we get in Kimberley Berkshire, I suppose, to protect herself. <laughs> and is, yeah, buried with her husband's sword. So, yeah, I had to laugh with her. An English eccentric, I think we could call her. I adored Cassandra. Um, and I feel that this is a study in contentment. So actually, she, it, it feel, she says, I have known happiness without man or marriage. I found a happiness true and sublime. Um, and you do give her a happy ending, as I think I understand she would want. Yes. Um, was, that, was that what you set out to do? Yes. One of the things that really bugged me, I read... I first read all the letters that Jane had written to Cassandra and, and saw how much they adored, or how much Jane adored Cassandra. I looked up to her, thought, she says in one letter, um, your, your last letter made me laugh out loud. You really are the finest comic writer of your generation, which coming from Jane is quite a thing. She was very dependent on her. And she um, always asked her opinion about anything. And towards the end of her life, she was physically and emotionally dependent on her and she died in Cassandra's arms. Then you read the family memoirs and they're all about the Blessed Jane, the brilliant, brilliant Blessed Jane. 
um, who never had a mood, who um, nothing horrible ever happened to her. She just loved everybody and lived quietly and wrote works of genius and then tragically died. And you think, really? And um, then for some reason, the family has to compare her to Cassandra and say, but Cassandra was joyless. Jane was my favorite. Aunt Jane was always my favorite. I had disappointment when Aunt Cassandra came along. And it struck me as so unfair because Jane, uh, the not uh, sort of um, tolerant of the failings of others, thought Cassandra was fabulous. Um, so she didn't have any complaints with her. But these, these, all of these nieces and nephews were disrespecting the woman who'd been their universal aunt because the, the reason it, the, the way it worked was that the brothers support after their father's death gave a joint pittance to the ladies, to their mother and to Jane and Cassandra, which enabled them to live in this cottage in Chorton and enabled Jane to write the six greatest novels in the English language. And in exchange, Cassandra was the one who always went to their houses, who was there when anyone was ill, when anyone was having a baby. Um, she was there at every birth. She taught all the children their letters. She ran the schoolroom while the mother was in confinement. Not a word of thanks. Just, it's such a thing about our society still that all of the credit in life is given to the great man and the great woman, the ones who changed the world, which is fantastic. They don't do it alone, but also the basically decent, and it's still true today, and we've seen it during this virus, the basically decent who do things for their neighbors and things for their loved ones and who are generous, you know, with their time and their care for no money and no reward, these are the people we should be admiring. Why did she? Why did they have to compare these two women and say one came off short? You know, Jane was fabulous. Cassandra was really important to the whole family, and and Jane saw that. And I really wanted to give her her due. Because another very extraordinary thing, I keep reading the statistic, and I'm always very um, reticent about putting it out because. It seems so extraordinary. Only 30% of women got married in that time. So 70% of them didn't get married. We know nothing about these spinster women because nobody has cherished their journals or their letters and they weren't writing books and being published and, and, and so on. The history of that time is the history of successful men and, and you know men with some sort of voice. And I very much wanted to explore what happened, how they found happiness. Were all their lives miserable? No, of course they weren't. Of course they weren't. They had each other. They looked after each other. Like the Austin ladies and Martha, they lived together. They put all their pittances in and together they had a slightly bigger pittance and together they could live. Well, perhaps that was better than 19th century marriage, which was often to a stranger. If you got married at 19, you might be you were in for 20 pregnancies. One of them would get you. Nobody, all of Jane's sisters, and look, well, three of Jane's sisters, and one died on the eighth, one died on the ninth, and one died on the 11th, baby. That's what got you. If you survived, your life was at all hardship. Jane, had she got married, would not have been able to write more than a letter. Not getting married saved her. Not getting married is, is, is what gave us those books. So they were having worthwhile lives, you know, they weren't teaching yet, they weren't nursing yet, but they were doing things in their community and they were looking out for each other and they had their own minds, you know, and their own time. And I wanted to present that. <clears throat> You've stolen my last line almost, <laughs> which is, I do feel that this is, this is a perfect book for this time. It's chock full of kindness it's chock full mm -hmm. as you say of female friendship which is lovely um and there is that sense all of the women they had the rug pulled out from under them at a moment's notice as we sort of ha have had uh, yeah. so it sort of feels both it it transports you to another time but it's of 
it's helpful to this time and it's certainly helpful it certainly helped me by taking me back to novels that I feel that my teenage self couldn't really um, um, interrogate in, in, in the way I can today. Um, you've mentioned generosity. Jill, thank you so much for your generosity oh. for appearing uh, for us today. And we thank absolutely you. look forward to seeing you uh, really at Buxton. Thank you very yes. much. Yes, one day, one day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.